happy Friday and welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch. Now, just a quick message before we get into this case. This is a story that can't really be told without discussing suicide. It's a central question to this mystery, and it's something that's an epidemic in our country. The CDC reports that suicide rates have increased 36% between the years 2000 to 2021. And in 2021, there was one death from it every 11 minutes. If you're struggling with suicidal thoughts, there is help for you. And on the other side of that help are so many reasons to continue living. If you live here in the U.S., you can find that help by dialing 988. If you're not here in the U.S., there are local services you can find online. Please reach out. Please find that help. In honor of the sensitive nature of today's topic, I'm not only disabling advertising on YouTube, but I'm also making a donation to the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. The case we're covering today is getting a lot of renewed attention thanks to a recent CNN article written by Thomas Lake earlier this year. The article is largely an attempt to dissect heaping mounts of conspiracy theory and find verifiable information in it. And while the article manages to toe that line well, it still leaves a lot of us wondering what happened to a hero. Should there be a pursuit for justice in his name? Or is this story actually a cautionary tale to families everywhere about the mental health of our first responders who are subjected to an unfathomable traumatic experience? Terrence Yeeke became a hero, saving the lives of several people. But Terry believed that he saw a truth that day, a truth that shook him to his very core and could bring the last remaining pillars of security in the United States down at a time when they've already literally been hit by a bomb blast. Terry was born on September 19, 1965, into a large family. He'd be one of six siblings, and he grew up in a town called El Reno, northwest of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. He was a 1984 graduate of Booker T. Washington High School and attended Redlands Community College for two years. He served in the military, spending time in Saudi Arabia, and came home to join the Oklahoma City Police Department in 1989. Over the next few years, he was married and had children while continuing his career of being a dedicated police officer. One story relates how he was called to back up a partner when his car broke down. So Terry got out of his broke down car and he ran the rest of the way, despite it being 100 degrees outside that day. As his police career would continue, so would his efforts to help his community. Terry began teaching in the department's D.A.R.E. youth anti-drug program in 1994, and he used his large stature, booming voice, and a touch of humor to reach the children that he was speaking to. Then came Wednesday, April 19th, 1995. It was at the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma. The nine-story building housed 14 federal agencies, including the Drug Enforcement Agency, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and recruitment offices for the Army and Marine Corps. At 9.02 a.m., just as many people were settling in for a day of work, a Ryder rental truck filled with explosives blew up. In a moment, more than a third of the building was leveled and an entire nation's sense of security and safety were shaken to their very core. Within seven seconds, 680 people were injured and 168 people lost their lives. The shockwave from that blast would damage other buildings in a 16-block radius, causing an estimated $652 million worth of damage, and also leaving several hundred people in the area instantly homeless. The blast was heard as far as 55 miles away and measured a 3 on the Richter scale. The first of 1,800 911 calls related to the bombing were called in, and first responders were heading to the scene. In the middle of what was being described as a titanic human disaster, two Oklahoma City Police Department officers were part of that first wave of response. Officer Jim Ramsey and his partner, 29-year-old Sergeant Terrence Yeeke. I can't imagine the feelings they must have had arriving at that site and realizing the scope of the task that they were trying to take on. Terry 
came across a man's arm sticking out of the ground. He tried to find a pulse. Nothing. He continued on to the next, trying to find survivors to pull from the rubble. Eventually, he came back to that arm and he realized that person was still alive. Richard Williams was that man. He was freed from the rubble and carried out by these amazing first responders. Then, Terry turned around and went back for more. Yiki wrote about his experience in a book called We Will Never Forget. He remembered someone he only knew as Randy. Quote, All we could see was part of his face. He was completely buried. We couldn't tell where his arms or legs were. We began lifting blocks of concrete off of Randy. He would tell us it hurt as we lifted the chunks one by one. I lifted a board off of his face, and part of his face peeled back. Finally, we freed Randy and started to carry him out. Suddenly, the ground I was walking on gave way, and I fell in a hole. Yiki was putting it mildly. He had actually fallen two stories, landing square on his back. The man he was saving was Randy Ledger, a maintenance worker who was cleaning light fixtures in the child care center one moment, and the next moment had broken glass piercing his carotid artery and his jugular vein. He remembered Terry and other rescuers digging him out and getting him onto a backboard, but then he blacked out. When he came back around, Randy was in an ambulance being treated, and Terry Yiki was there too, being treated for that back injury. Randy Ledger would need 12 pints of blood and numerous surgeries, but he would survive. Terry would have to be taken to a local hospital for treatment. Within the first hour, 50 people were rescued from that rubble, and Terry Yiki was responsible for at least four of those rescues. 90 minutes after the bomb went off, a highway patrolman pulled over a guy who was driving without a license plate. That man was Timothy McVeigh. The officer also found illegal weapons in the car, and McVeigh was arrested. In total, four people would be found to be involved with the planning and execution of the bombing, with three of them being sentenced and one granted immunity for testifying against the others. McVeigh was executed in 2001. However, as with any tragedy of this magnitude, there were people that didn't believe the official explanation. There had to be more to this. There's no way that McVeigh's rented rider truck filled with explosives could have done that damage. There had to be other charges in the building. It had to be some sort of government conspiracy. One of the people who thought that there was more to this was someone who was boots on ground just a few hours prior, pulling people from the wreckage. And that man was Terrence Yiki. His wife, Tanya, got a call from a nearby hospital saying that Terry had injured his back and he needed to be picked up. In the car, Tanya said that Terry began to cry. Tanya, it's not what they're saying it is. They're not telling the truth. They're lying about what's going on down there. People close to Yiki said that he spoke of being surprised to see an army of federal agents in riot gear only moments after the blast and that the direction of the blast didn't seem right. He was certain the wreckage he saw around him was evidence of the building being blown apart from the inside. He might think that in the shock and horror of what he experienced that day, that maybe his brain was short-circuiting, struggling to come to grips or even distract him from the harsh realities that he had just faced. But those initial thoughts seemed to become firm beliefs, and his actions show that those beliefs stayed with him. Terry started trying to investigate it for himself even attempting to get back to the scene of the bombing to look for evidence, but being turned away by an agent securing the area. Terry wrote up a nine-page report and turned it into his superiors at the department. Tanya said that he came home a few days later upset. The report had disappeared, and his superiors were demanding a new report of only one page, with several of those details he had previously explained being left out. Another officer named Steve Vassar said that he had a somewhat similar experience. He believes that he witnessed the rider truck as it was driving in. And despite the official conclusion that McVeigh was driving it alone, Vassar was certain that he saw a passenger in the vehicle. He wrote it up in his report, and a few years later he checked the department's records computer trying to find that old report. Quote, They were gone. 
They were not in the system as if I was never there. A friend of Terry's named Ramona McDonald, who Terry met in the aftermath of the bombing, said he wrote a letter to her stating, I think my days as a police officer are numbered. I think there's a lot of secrets floating around now about my mental state. I believe that a lot of the problems the officers are having right now are because some of them know what really happened and can't deal with it. Now, I've seen some copies of correspondence between Ramona and Terry, and it does seem to me that Ramona was struggling with the official story as well and looking to understand what really happened by having gatherings with several other survivors. The stress of uncovering this truth may have just been too much for Terry's household. His marriage fell apart in late 1995, and court documents say that Terry became abusive to his wife, Tanya. A protective order was issued, and Terry was to only have contact with Tanya on matters of visitation with their children. Despite that, Terry seemed to keep working on the case that was now haunting him and had cost him so much already. In the spring of 1996, Tanya noticed that Terry's anxiety seemed to be increasing. He was talking about his days being numbered, saying that Tanya should leave with him to get married so he can make sure the girls are taken care of if something happened to him. He brought a VCR and placed it in Tanya's trunk, but didn't say why. He told her he'd be back, but that was the last time that Tanya saw her ex-husband. Terry's friend, Ramona McDonald, would say that the last time she saw Terry, he was talking about an appointment. Two men that wanted to meet with him and go over the evidence that he had gathered. He told Ramona that he was nervous about the meeting, but thought it'd be smarter if he went to that meeting unarmed so that his weapon couldn't be used against him. He was willing to take this risk on the belief that he might finally be meeting the cavalry that he'd been waiting for. Maybe he was going to be able to set things right and get the truth out there. He left for the meeting. It was 6 p.m. on May 8th, 1996, when a sheriff noticed a maroon Ford probe sitting off the road. He pulled up and took a look. There was no one around. The doors were locked, the windows were up, but inside, the deputy could see a large amount of blood. And that wasn't all. There was a razor blade, an empty gun holster, and a Bible. About a half mile away, they would find the body of Terence Yeeke. His life had ended right before he was to be honored and decorated. The LA Times would report, a police officer who would have received a bravery medal Saturday for rescuing people from last year's Oklahoma City bombing was found dead of apparently self-inflicted wounds. Police dogs and helicopters led deputies to the body of Oklahoma City Police Sergeant Terrence Yeeke. He apparently tried to cut his wrists and ultimately shot himself in a nearby field in El Reno, about 40 miles west of Oklahoma City, Captain Bill City said. Yiki had been having some personal problems involving a past marriage, but the bombing also weighed heavily on him, City said. Yiki carried four or five people to safety after the blast. Less than 12 hours after his body was found, it was being reported in the press that Terrence Yiki had ended his own life. Tanya told the police chief that they were wrong. Terry didn't do this himself, and she wanted an autopsy. Terrence Yiki was supposed to receive the Medal of Valor, but some close to him said that he didn't want it. As a matter of fact, people in his department said that Terry wouldn't even wear the golden pin in the shape of a ribbon that was to honor the victims of the bombing, and he wouldn't return calls from the people he had rescued. He was clearly troubled by this truth that he believed he had uncovered that day, and regardless if it was real or some form of post-traumatic stress disorder, it seemed he was actively working that investigation through to its end. Why would he stop and tell Ramona about this meeting that he had planned, and his plan to leave his gun behind? Quote, I think they murdered Terry because he knew too much his sister, LaShawn Hargrove, would say. And one of the people that Terry saved on that fateful day, Randy Ledger, thinks, quote, there's too many unanswered questions. Can those questions ever be answered? In my mind, you have to look in both directions to see where that truth leads. And 
the initial assumption by law enforcement and the press seems like a logical place to start. Another report from the LA Times in 1999 would highlight that four years after the bombing, at least five other people had ended their own lives. A former army captain named Lawrence Martin, who survived the explosion, would later intentionally fly his single-engine Cessna into the ground in a church pasture. There were two rescue workers, a husband of one of the victims, even a federal prosecutor named Ted Richardson, a man who literally helped put the case together against Timothy McVeigh, ended his own life. Medicalnewstoday.com explains that survivor's guilt is when a person has feelings of guilt because they've survived a life-threatening situation when others did not. It's a common reaction to traumatic events and a symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. They also call out several groups that regularly experience survivor's guilt, including witnesses to a traumatic event and first responders. People dealing with survivor's guilt are caught up in thoughts of what they did and didn't do that could have changed outcomes for themselves and others. They can have flashbacks, obsessive thoughts, anger, fear, social isolation, and thoughts about ending their lives. It can cause them to view the world as an unfair and unsafe place. In some cases, they can even feel like their role caused negative outcomes or they did something wrong. Where logic might say, Terry was a hero. He saved several people's lives. From his perspective, he might be struggling with a totally different viewpoint on that reality. Unfortunately, logic and disorders of this nature are not always in step with each other. How do you deal with survivor's guilt? Many people recover without any significant treatment in the first year. However, at least one third will have symptoms of PTSD that persist for three years or more. Experts in the media spoke of how trauma from the Oklahoma City bombing would likely reach its peak in three to five years and noted there were other effects that were much harder to trace. Failed marriages, ruined careers, drug and alcohol dependence. While a death always affects family members, an occurrence like this has a long-lasting impact on an entire community, even an entire nation. While the mental health component seems to support a strong possibility of this being an act of self-harm, CNN reports that several more officers that worked with Terry Yiki also have their doubts about the official story. An officer that helped with Terry's initial training said, I still think he was murdered. Another that is said to be one of his closest friends on the force said, I just have a hard time believing that Terry would take his life. But what about Terry's partner that arrived with him at the scene of the bombing, Jim Ramsey? He was quoted in one article at the New York Times as saying he had a lot of guilt because he got hurt. But when asked if he believed that Terry took his own life at another time, he plainly said, no, I guess I don't. So we have a lot of people questioning it. Do we have some analysis or hard facts to point to something else being at play here? I mean, can't this all be put to rest by reviewing the autopsy report? Not exactly. No autopsy was performed. You have an officer involved in a shooting with other signs of substantial trauma to his body, but for some reason there's no autopsy? There was a report written by the medical examiner which noted multiple superficial incised wounds to his wrists, neck, and the inner crook of his arm. The report also listed his probable cause of death as gunshot wound to the head. Admittedly, the description of the items in his car and brief explanation of his wounds could be explained by him taking his own life, except for a few things that stand out. Now, I've worked on several cases where the question of did they end their own lives or did someone else do it comes up. And the experts that I've worked with are adamant that the act of suicide is a person trying to end their pain. This scene sounds like someone, and possibly it could have been Terry, but it could have been someone else, wanted him to feel even more pain. And remember, the blade is left back in his car. He had wounds to his arms and neck, but after inflicting those wounds, he decided to walk a half mile to end it all somewhere else. Why? 
Also, based on Vernon Gebert's book, Practical Homicide Investigation, a scene like this should be treated as a homicide until it's proven that it isn't. Yet, we know from the Associated Press articles coming out less than 12 hours later, it has clearly been stated that this is a suicide. How much investigation could have happened in that time frame? There was reportedly no note left behind. And most death investigations that I've looked into, even the ones that do involve self-harm, they still usually have an autopsy conducted. Another OCPD officer, Don Browning, would say, how dare you not do an autopsy on an unattended death on a police officer? To add to the strange occurrences, the Oklahoma City Police Department took over the investigation, even though Terry's body was not found in their city limits. He was found near El Reno. Now, El Reno has their own police department, and even if he wasn't in the proper city limits for El Reno, the county of Canadian has a sheriff's office. Now, it's not unheard of if OCPD wanted to assist another department, especially if they're smaller departments, which I think might be the case here. But taking over the investigation, particularly when the victim is an officer of your organization, it certainly doesn't lower the amount of suspicion around this case. CNN reached out. Apparently, the police chief won't be interviewed about this case now. The medical examiner's office, basically not talking. But back at that time, some comments from law enforcement did make it into the press. Can we look at those to find out if they're correct? As we heard in the LA Times article, comments were made alluding to Terry having some issues in his personal life, including his broken marriage. Despite conflicting information from within Oklahoma City Police Department about tension involving his ex-wife, she says that she and Terry were actually on good terms leading up to his death. There was even talk of them possibly getting remarried. After Terry's death, Tanya said that someone broke into her home. And remember that VCR that he left for her? That disappeared. She also believed that there was a tape in that VCR, but she never got the chance to watch it. Ramona McDonald says that her home was also broken into around that same time. She feared for her life so much that she's changed her name and moved out of state. I'm also wondering, shouldn't this be considered a closed case if they're saying that he did end his own life? Shouldn't someone, likely from his family be able to access those records? Well, CNN did file a request and received a two-page report, which was heavily redacted. They couldn't even tell if a gun was found at the scene, a key question considering the information from Ramona about Terry leaving his gun behind. If there was no gun found at that scene, that would certainly throw this story into a whole other direction completely. If it was there, why wouldn't OCPD at least release that information specifically to quell some of these conspiracy rumors around this case? A spokesman for the Oklahoma City Police Department did respond to CNN via email and said, there is absolutely no hard or physical evidence whatsoever to support Yiki was murdered. Anyone who suggests the Oklahoma City Police Department participated in the cover-up of the murder of one of its most popular officers is engaging in fool's folly. Someone that seems to be engaged in that fool's folly is retired Tulsa police officer and author Craig Roberts. He states, I feel the evidence and facts point to a torture homicide, and he thinks there's evidence to prove it. Evidence that he might know something about with his experience as a former Marine sniper. He believes the entry wound shows use of a silencer, and the trajectory is from an execution-style shot that Terry was likely on his knees with someone standing over him. He also struggles with the same point I mentioned, hearing from experts who deal in cases of this nature, quote, there were multiple cuts on his wrists, inner elbows, and jugular veins. If he was going to shoot himself, why would he cut himself so many times? Now, I've looked at a website that Craig has put together, and while some of the analysis is certainly worth considering, some of it did strike me as falling a little far down the rabbit hole. The thing that makes countering bad information really tough in this case is the lack of official information and really that missing autopsy report. 
Tanya has heard from others in law enforcement that there's very little documentation on Terry's body because there was much more evidence that supported he had actually been killed. She says there were signs of him being either bound and or handcuffed and dragged across the ground. Craig Roberts also states on his website that Tanya had to move five times in the first three years since the Oklahoma City tragedy, and she continues to get intimidating letters and threatening phone calls. With a lot of cases I look into, I get frustrated about not being able to find a solid understanding. This is another one of those cases. At the start of today's episode, I asked, should there be a pursuit for justice in Terry's name, or is this story actually a cautionary tale to families everywhere? And at this point, I feel like it's a little of both. In either case, Terrence Yeeke was indeed a hero and clearly believed in the difference that one person can make. Terrence is buried in the El Reno Cemetery in his hometown. As for the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building, it is now a national memorial featuring what is called the Gates of Time. The 901 gate is a symbolic reference to the last minute of innocence for our nation in regards to domestic terrorism. The time of 902 is represented by a large reflecting pool representing the tragically long minute in which citizens were killed, survived, and changed forever. It reaches toward the second gate, which is marked with 903, a symbolic reference to the first moment of recovery, the moment when grieving and healing began, a moment that I believe Terry was desperately trying to find for himself and for the rest of us. Please join us again here soon on the Lord and Arts channel.